Good morning, everybody. Just sang some songs, and the last one was God is so good. He is. And I want to talk about... Thank you. That helps. <laughs> um, last few times I've been up here, I've been talking about stop and think. I'm going to do it again. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 4. You don't have to, I'm there. Right? You can just listen along. Ephesians chapter 4, I want to read, I'm going to read verses 22 through 24. It says, That you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man which is corrupt according to... That thing took off on me. I'll start over. Is that you going to leave it that loud, Ernie? That's good. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we're in Ephesians chapter 4, 22 through 24. It says that he put off concerning the former conversation, the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind that he put on the new man which is after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Stop and think. Are we renewed in our spirit? Do we? Are you putting on the new man? I picked five things to talk about. At the end of it, I'll tell you what thing, why I picked the five. I'll say it that way. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 16 now. It says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Probably don't need much explanation on that. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. It's sad that every time you turn on the news or watch TV or some of the stuff that's going on from the White House all the way down to just our, our local neighborhoods. It's pitiful. Didn't even when I was a kid, some of the things that goes on nowadays, you never even heard of it. And I'm sure the older you are, the more you can relate to that. Ephesians 6 6. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as a servant of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Philippians now, chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. Let me see, make sure I get, yep. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Are you pressing forward? Colossians chapter 1. I want to read verse 9 through 11. For this cause we also, since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasings, and being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long-suffering with joyfulness. Are we walking worthy? Are we increasing in the knowledge of God? And this one has always been hard for me. Long-suffering with joyfulness. Something's going wrong around you? Are you... Joyful about it? I know I'm not. But you know what? If you do have something going on due to the fact of your stand for Christ, take that as a blessing. 
The real question is, are we increasing? Are we doing? Now, you know why I, want to, I picked these this morning? Because I know I need to do better. That's why I wanted everybody to stop and think. We all have room for improvement. I'll put myself on the top of the list. And it's hard to do some of these things, but if you're walking in the spirit of Christ, you can do it. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for this day, Lord. I want to thank you for everything you've done for us, Lord. You have blessed us so much, Father. And if we would just keep our hearts and minds centered on you, Lord, the things that go on around us, Father, they wouldn't be so heavy on us, Lord. And I pray, Father, that you be with the pastor today, guide his tongue. I pray, Father, your spirit would be here in a mighty way, Father, that it would convict us and mold us to be the person that you would want us to be. In Jesus' name I pray and I ask these things. Amen. It's been said that when you read a scripture, just don't read it. You read it, you close your eyes, and you visualize it. I have a feeling our pastor does that sometimes. Don't you think you do? <laughs> this is what Austin Miles did. He was a, a pharmacist, and he wrote gospel songs, and uh, was a director of choirs and of music some places. But he was also a photographer. So when he went into his dark room, he would read his scripture. John 20 was his favorite passage, the Easter story. And he would read it, close his eyes, and visualize it. So these are his words when he did that. My hands were resting on the Bible while I stared at the light blue wall. As the light faded, I seemed to be standing at the entrance of a garden, looking down a gently winding path shaded by olive branches. A woman in white, with head bowed, with hands clasped to her throat, holding back sobs, walked slowly into the shadows. It was Mary. As she came to the tomb upon which she placed her hand, she bent over to look in and hurried away John. In flowing robe appeared looking at the tomb then came peter who entered the tomb followed slowly by john as they departed mary reappeared leaning her head upon her arm at the tomb and she wept turning herself she saw jesus standing so did i i knew it was he she knelt before him with arms outstretched and looking into his face cried, Rabboni. I awakened in full light, gripping my Bible, with muscles tense and nerves vibrating. Under the inspiration of this vision, I wrote as quickly as the words would be formed, the poem exactly as it has since appeared. That same evening, I wrote the music. to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear the Son of God discloses and he walks with me talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever 
known. Speaks at the sound of his voice is so sweet the birds hush their singing and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing i stay in the garden with him though the night around me be falling but he bids me go through the voice of woe his voice to me is calling and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known Thank you, Linda and Judy. Thank you for your ministry and song. That's a song has ministered to many, many people through the years. And there's a good reason why. Because God is still speaking to us through his word. And our hearts have to be receptive and responsive to the word. It's kind of like a radio signal. It's going out. But is it, are you getting the signal? How many brought your copy of the Word of God with you today? Just lift it up here. <laughs> the little song we used to sing when we were, when I was little. I was little once, believe it or not. <laughs> was the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. <laughs> Aren't you glad that the Word of God stands forever? Heaven and earth may pass away, but my words shall never pass away. Think about the preservation, just because, hold it up, got your Bible there. <laughs> Think about the lives that have been sacrificed just for you to have a copy of God's Word today. Many people have died because of this copy of God's Word. They love God's Word. They love the Lord. And it comes through sacrifice, this Bible. And it's the ancient words of Christ that should dwell in us richly, not just on a page, but written on the hearts of those who are committed to Christ. <laughs> this song speaks about the ancient words of Christ. May we come with open hearts, it says, and receive these words which Christ is imparting to us, the living words of Christ. The Word of God is living, and it's powerful, isn't it? And it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Let's sing about it today. Already, holy words, long preserved for our walk in this world. They resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart words of life, words of hope. Give us strength, help us cope. In this world where every roam, ancient words will guide us home. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts, Oh, let the ancient words impart Holy words of our faith Handed down to this age Came to us through sacrifice Oh, heed the faithful words of Christ Holy words long preserved for our walk in this world they resound with god's
God's own heart. Oh, let the would just stand together with me now. Ready? Lift it up. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts. Oh, let the ancient words lift it up again, brothers and sisters. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts. Oh, let the ancient words impart. We have come with open hearts. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Peter, Cindy, Charlie, <laughs> Emily. <laughs> That's it. Oh, my. It's getting worse every day, people. Every day. Well, I want you to take your Bibles and turn over to Mark chapter 10. Again, we're, we're going to have one more message concerning this next week. But we've been going through, again, the message of the rich young ruler. And, and uh, we saw last week the message was really concerning this man, his character, and so forth. And we read again in Mark chapter 10, starting with verse 17. Mark 10, 17. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master. What shall I do that I may inherit eternal, eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, and that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these things I observe from my youth. And then Jesus, beholding him loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, take up thy cross, and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he ate great possessions. And Jesus looked round about and said to his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And his disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished without measure, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? And Jesus looking upon them saith, with men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. Father, I pray this morning as we again dwell in the scriptures, we get into it and, and think about it and imagine it and, and, let, and let the truth permeate us, Lord. I pray that you would help us to see truth, not just for ourselves, Although, Lord, there's no doubt there's areas that we need to change. But, Lord, as we walk into a lost world, that we would be able to have the truth, that we would have an answer to the questions they may have. God, equip us to be the saints that you've called us to be. And we'll give you the praise for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, we saw last week, number one, that this man was rich. It says again in Matthew 19, 22, that he had great possessions. And in Luke 18, verse 23, it says he was very rich. He wasn't your typical wealthy, I can buy a mansion person. He was a wealthy as in, 
I can buy the whole community if I want to, wealthy. He had tremendous, tremendous possessions. And in that day and time, it was seen as a sign from God that you had God's blessing upon you. The second thing, he was a young man, according to Matthew 19, 22. You say, well, what's so important that? in that? He wasn't set in all of his ways. How many old people do you know? I'm getting to be one. That are set in their ways. They're going to believe what they're going to believe. And it doesn't matter what you say. Matter of fact, one of the things about old people is they also will tell you what they believe. They don't care anymore what you think, right? This was a young man, though. Very intelligent, very wealthy, and still was moldable. We'll see that next week, maybe. Okay, Lord willing. And the third thing is he was a ruler. It says in Luke 18, 18, he was a certain ruler. But we saw that he believes in eternal life. So by that very standard, he was a Pharisee, not a Sadducee. He looked for the life to come. He desired to keep the law and obey God, which was evident by his life. He believed that he was good. Unfortunately, he equated his goodness and Jesus' goodness as being on the same level. Good master. Just like I'm a good master. Is there one thing you can show me? But you know what? He was also fearful because he realized he did lack something. Apparently this Jesus had something that he could offer him, something that he could apply to his life. But you know, we saw and we understand that no amount of works that you do will ever give you peace. Works don't give peace. Work can give enjoyment. It can give joy in the things that you do. But it will not bring peace to your heart. If you're trying to work your way to heaven, you will never have an assurance of your salvation. Why? Works will never save you. So when he said, just one more thing, what else can I do? One thing more, Lord. What did Jesus say? Well, Jesus came, Jesus' answer was what? This do. Have everything you have, sell it, give it to the poor. Wow. Wait a minute. That's a lot more than I wanted to hear. Now, I'm going to just say something. Was it something, if he'd sold everything and gave it to the poor, would that have given him eternal life? No. That wasn't Christ's intent. It wasn't about selling everything and having eternal life. It was about showing this man where his error was, where his thinking was, what he was depending upon. And so in this case, when he said do it, Jesus knew he was going to walk away sorrowfully. He knew the outcome. The reason was, was to show the man where his heart truly lived. Where he dwelt. It was about the things that he had. And again, it was about his teaching that he had. Because he'd been taught all his life. That if you're prosperous, if you're wealthy, you are in God's favor. And so again, this young man thought that if, if he was good, he, if he came to this good master who was his equal, if he could do just one more thing to push him over the hump, then he would be assured of entrance into the kingdom of God and ultimately eternal life. And you know what really was going on there? There was just a whole lot of goodness going on there, right? A whole lot of goodness all around this rich young man. But what did Jesus do? Well, he points him to the law. He recites five out of the ten, from commandments, five through ten out of the commandments. And why did Jesus do that? Well, because this man really did believe that he was spiritually alive. He believed that he was good enough. 
He believed that his goodness would give him eternal life through the law. But I want you to understand something. The law never gave life. The law never gave life. The law shows us our sinfulness. It reveals the fact that we are condemned before God. And the law brings forth death. I want you to go to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. And let's look at the function of the law. I'm going to read a few verses to you and then give you an illustration that may help under your understanding in this. Romans chapter 7 starting with verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Well, what was Jesus doing with the rich young ruler? He was laying the law out to him. These are the different things that I want you to consider. And it goes on to say, But sin taking occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, okay, in other words, wickedness, evil, for without the law, sin was dead. So what does the law do? It reveals what's going on in your life. And again, it says, for without the law, sin was dead. The law makes us aware of our condition. We think we're alive. But when the law comes, it reveals our sinfulness. It says again in verse number 9, For I was alive without the law once. Well, what's that mean? That means in my own self-righteousness, I thought I was alive. I thought I was doing what God wanted. I thought I had eternal life because of my works, because of my efforts. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. I realized that what I thought was life was death. What I thought I should be doing to bring life was not doing that at all. And it goes on and says, And the commandment which, I, which was ordained to life, I found to be death for the sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me and by it slew me. And I'm going to stop here for just a minute and give you an illustration. Back in the early 1900s, there was a thing called prohibition. Before prohibition became law, people drank. They didn't think anything about it. Matter of fact, they got drunk. They didn't think much about it. But when the law changed and it said that you could no longer drink alcoholic beverages, what happened? When they started dumping the alcohol out of windows, when they started taking axes to the barrels and breaking them open, what happened? Well, people who drank, and even to excess, went ballistic. They started doing anything they could to get alcohol. And it wasn't because of alcoholism necessarily. It was because they were being told, you cannot drink. And the old sin nature welled up inside of them. They didn't even realize what they were doing in the sense. Why? Because it was a normal thing of life until it was taken away, until a law. Paul is saying here, there were things that apart from the law, I didn't realize was sin. But all of a sudden when the law was given and it started searching my heart, sin revived. 
It was like throwing gasoline on the fire and the burn of the lust, whatever it was for, just flamed up. See, when you have a child, isn't it interesting? They can be doing things that they shouldn't be doing and you tell them, don't do that. Got a grandson. And he's at the age, two years of age, and he'll look right at you and say, no. And he'll go out of his way to do what you have just said don't do. Why? There's a sin nature. And when the law comes down, he flares up. We're all guilty of that. We don't like being told what we can do or not do. And so again, that, that's what's going on here. And it says in verse 11, it says, For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me, and it slew me. In other words, the law comes up and says I can't do something. Well, I'm going to do it anyway. And I'm going to do it to excess. Why? The sin nature fights against that. So the law, in a sense, deceives. Why? Because it's saying, it's trying to put you under control. And by its very nature sl slew me. Wherefore, is the, wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. In other words, God's purpose wasn't to bring death. It was to show that you're already dead. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. What's the law do? The law shows us that we are sinners. Now what was this young man doing? He's saying, I'm keeping the law. I'm alive. I'm doing what's good. I am good. Why? Because he didn't see the law as convicting him. And I mentioned before, Jesus never condemned the young man when he made that statement. He never condemned him and said, you know what, you're a sinner. You've broken them all. Because it's very possible that from that young man's earliest memories up, he kept that law. Mentioned about Paul. Paul kept the law. Pharisee of the Pharisees. Concerning the law, blameless. What a statement. Apparently two of them could make that claim. Jesus never condemned him. But what does Jesus do? Jesus gives him some more information, doesn't he? then go sell everything you have and give to the poor. And we know ultimately that what that did was it, it did what? It showed that he didn't love God more than his possessions and he didn't love his neighbor as himself. He violated the very tenets which all the law and prophet hung on. And so this man again believed he was spiritually alive. He believed he was good enough. He believed that his goodness gave him eternal life. But it didn't. Everyone believes in their heart that they're spiritually alive in some way. They hope, now I'm talking about the lost person. They hope they've done enough good. They hope that when they stand before God, all the good things they did will overshadow or will weigh more than the bad things they did. If you talk to a person on the street about if they're going to heaven and they start telling you about the good things they've done or that they're a good person, what they're saying is, you know what? I know I've done wrong, but I've done enough good to cover that. And the scales will tip to my favor. The average person if you ask them, we'll say, I never killed anybody. I never committed adultery. I never stole anything. But we know, again, the Ten Commandments are not just physical action. 
It's not just breaking them physically. It is that of the heart as well. That's what one of the things that Jesus taught, again, in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 to 48. He said, listen, if you hate your brother, that's the same as murder. If you lust after a woman or a man, that is, again, lust in your heart. That is the same as being an adulterer. So what does the law do? Again, the law points out our sinfulness. The law condemns us before God. The law makes us realize that we are not alive, that we are dead. And the law leaves us hopeless. It leaves us without hope. That's why Paul wrote, if you stay right here in Romans chapter 7, and you look at the end of the chapter out here, Paul wrote in verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? The law has pointed out, I am guilty. Then he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so that with the mind... I myself serve the law of God. What's we talked about putting on a new mind. Joe talked about this morning. Putting on a new man, the new mind. He says, but with the flesh, the law of sin. That's the old man. That's the battle. That's what Paul was talking about. Oh, wretched man, I am in a battle. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, I believe, it talks about, again, beating himself into submission. Why? Because that old nature's there. But yet, he's a new creature in Christ. There's a battle going on. Verse, chapter 8, verse 1, it says, Therefore, that there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the what? The flesh, but after the Spirit. A lost man cannot walk after the Spirit, by the way. You have to be saved a lost man is religious and as spiritual as he wants to be is lost. He's in darkness. His religion will not save him. He goes on to say, For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, that it would, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Now watch who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. We have to walk after the Spirit. We must be Spirit-filled. And no amount of works that we do will make us Spirit-filled. How do we become Spirit-filled? By the way, you're full of the Spirit, just so you know. You have, if you're saved, the Holy Spirit indwells you. But how do you become filled with the Spirit? You have to die to yourself. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. You have to be a living sacrifice. You have to die to your flesh and allow the Spirit of God to work through you. See, that's why Paul wrote those things. And just like Paul, again thought he was alive in the flesh at one time, this young ruler actually believed that he was spiritually alive because he was good and he kept the law. Yet Moses wrote in the law, he said this in Exodus 27, 26, Cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them. And at that point when he read that, it says, And all the people shall say, Amen. I agree. Verily, it's true. Paul confirmed that the law brings death. In Romans 3.20, he says, Therefore by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6 says, Not the letter, but the Spirit, for the letter killeth, but the Spirit gives life. The law never saved. So why did Jesus give the rich young ruler the law? 
Well, Galatians 3 verse 19 gives us something there. It says, Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Galatians 3 verses 21 and 22 says, For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been given by the law. But the scripture is concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. The law cannot save. Jesus gave the rich young ruler the law for the same reason we give people the law today. Do you realize the law is still effective today? So that they might see their sinfulness, so that they might recognize or realize their condemnation, so that they may come to a point of experiencing hopelessness in what they're doing and appoint them to the only solution to their sin-cursed existence, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. We give the law, it says, to shut their mouths. Amen. We give the law to shut their mouths. Why? Because they're always accusing or excusing themselves. But when the law is presented and they realize that they are a sinner, it shuts down their mouths they have no answer why because the spirit of god convicts using the law the law is important it doesn't save it condemns it points you though to one who will save jesus christ now again this man truly believed that he was alive he had from his youth up the scripture says kept the law or at least what he thought he was doing yet Jesus challenged him in one area and when he did his whole world came crashing down in Mark chapter 10 if you'll go back now to Mark Mark chapter 10 it says go thy way sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor and then thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and take up thy cross and follow me and what was the man's response in Mark Chapter 10, verse 22, it says, And he was sad at that saying and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. The word sad there does mean to be sad or sorrowful, but it has the idea of the sky being covered with clouds. Now, being in northeast Ohio, we understand that. Life is gloomy. Life sometimes, when you see the sun, it's like, what is that thing? I've read about it in books. Why? Because we live in that part of the country. And so here he had come to Jesus knowing that he himself was all right. Then Jesus with just one statement started to rain on his parade. He thought it was all good. And again, his self-righteousness sent him away grieved or threw him into a fit of sorrow. See, his whole belief system of keeping the law, his self-righteousness, all his works, all his training, and we're talking from a youth up, all his religion, all his hope in himself had just been dashed to pieces. Listen, he believed, again, as his disciples did, that his wealth, number one, was an evidence that he was blessed of God. He believed, to, number two, that his knowledge, he was a ruler, was evidence that he had been blessed by God. That his lifestyle, he was wealthy. It was evidence in his mind that he was blessed of God. He was just like Abraham. He was just like Solomon. And he even thought he was just like Jesus. He was blessed. So why did Jesus tell him to go and sell his possessions again to the poor? It was to confront him with proof that he could not keep the law and in fact had been breaking it all along. 
In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus taught about giving good gifts to, to your children, to those in need. He said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, Therefore all things whatsoever ye would do, or ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Again, from Deuteronomy 6, 5 and Leviticus 19, 8. A year and a half later from that time, from the time of the Sermon on the Mount in Luke chapter 10, a lawyer approaches Jesus and he asks much the same thing this man, except it said he was tempting Jesus. It says, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Same thing the rich young ruler asked. And Jesus' response to this man, what is written in the law? Now with this young man, he said, here is the law and he gave him. Six of the commandments. But with the lawyer, again, one who was like a scribe of the law, he says, again, what's written in the law? And the lawyer says this, Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And you know what Jesus responded to this man? He says, Thou hast answered right. Do this, and thou shalt live. But here's what the lawyer says back. But he willing to justify himself said unto Jesus, And who's my neighbor? Who's my neighbor? And then we get the parable of the Good Samaritan. Who's my neighbor? See, mankind has always believed that they were good enough to enter into eternal life based upon their own goodness. Yet when confronted by the law and its convicting power convicting of a judgment or convincing of judgment, they begin to justify themselves. How many of you have talked to somebody concerning their need of salvation and, well, I'm not that bad. I mean, I'm a pretty good person. Or I go to church. Or I go to mass. Or I give. Or I help the poor. They start listing all the things they do. That's where their mind is. And that's exactly where the rich young ruler was and did in Mark chapter 10 verse 22. He heard what the law stated. He considered what it demanded. And then he chose to walk away. He justified himself, but he was grieved. He'd been hit over the head with truth the first time in his life. I want to ask you a question. How many of you, when confronted by the law, when convicted of your sin, when challenged about your works, have justified yourself and walked away? Do you have a reoccurring sin in your life? Maybe something hadn't happened in years, but boom, here it is again. How easy it is to justify ourselves. How many of you hoped before you got saved and knew the truth, hoped that you were good enough to inherit eternal life. Listen, I mean, we can't be so bad that God would throw us in hell. I mean, come on. I'm a pretty good person. I work for a living. I take care of my family. I'm a good citizen in the community. Most people try to weigh out their accomplishments, their deeds, their actions, their works. They try to justify themselves before both God and man with their goodness. Again, that's exactly what this rich young ruler was doing. He rejected the words of Jesus and the offer that Jesus made him. Then Jesus turns to his apostles, the men that should have known truth the men that should have understand what happens and he makes this statement in verse 23 how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God and at this point you would think that those apostles again that had walked with Jesus and that they would have agreed with Jesus matter of fact you would have thought that when they saw what they saw and I appreciate uh, what you said about thinking closing your eyes and thinking through things you would think that they would have said, this man's lost his opportunity. You would have thought they would have been grieved by what Jesus had said to him. That, that they would, again, have looked at their 
own decisions to take up the cross and to follow Jesus, that, that this is what he should be doing. But what's it say? It says in verse 24, and his disciples were astonished at his words. They were amazed. Matter of fact, that word means they were frightened. Wow. It blew them back. Wait a minute. Why? I mean, if a rich person can't get into heaven, who can, they said. Why? Because their thinking, everything they'd been taught, the wealthy were blessed of God, the wealthy have an opportunity. I mean, God has shown his graciousness to them. And so you say, well, why would these men be shaken? Again, that is what they have been taught all their life. They have been taught according to societal norms that wealth was an evidence of God's blessing in their life. That wealth linked them to God's favor where poverty was equated with God's judgment. You think about men in the Old Testament. Job was wealthy. Oh yeah, he struggled, but what's, when that period of time was over, God blessed him even more abundantly. It was God's blessing. Think about Abraham. Abraham was wealthy. Solomon was wealthy. They were seen as this was the blessing of God. We have a whole religious movement in this country. It's called the health and the wealth and the prosperity gospel, which teaches the same principle. You should be able to name it and you should be able to claim it mentality. You're not right with God unless God has blessed you with your desires and your possessions. Name it and claim it. But what was Jesus teaching toward the way, that way of thinking or practice? Look at verses 24 and 25 in Mark 10. He says, children, how hard is it for them to trust in riches, or for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. I want you to notice something. Jesus did not condemn riches. He didn't condemn riches. Nor did he state that poverty was a prerequisite to get into the kingdom of God. You know, the widow, when she gave two mites, was not her ticket to salvation. Lazarus, who sat outside the rich man's gate and begged, and when he died, he entered into heaven, and yet the rich man entered into hell, it wasn't because he was poor and the rich man was rich. That's not why one was in heaven and one was in hell. Again, a person's wealth or lack of wealth is not the ticket into heaven. But wealth can certainly hinder a man from entering into heaven if he trusts in his riches. That's the difference. Wealth can be a blessing. Wealth can be used for the kingdom of God. Wealth is not a bad thing. Unless that's where you put your trust. And see, this is where this young man put his trust. I've got all this. I'm obviously blessed. And so let me emphasize the problem, but trusting in wealth certainly is. But so is trusting in works. Trusting in your heritage. Trusting in your own self-righteousness. Trusting in anything other than the grace of God and his mercy through the redemptive work of Jesus Christ at Calvary. It doesn't matter what you trust in. If it's anything other than the blood of Christ, you have trusted amiss. What you have trusted in is false. You know, it, it goes on to say here, Again, if you are saved, basically what we see in here is you're saved by grace and through faith alone. There is no self-directed or self-completed works that can save you. I love the fact that we've had history today. Okay? Elvina Hall in 1865, just a couple of years after the song you presented to us, or maybe before, I don't remember, there were two dates you gave there, but she wrote this, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. 
Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. You realize that was a truth. She was a Methodist that used to be held in the Methodist church back in the day. How much the world has changed. How much our churches have changed. How much our denominations have changed. Salvation never came to man based on his own merit. Works included. Wealth or anything else. The law never saved anyone. See, if you're trusting again in anything other than the blood of Jesus Christ to wash away your sins, then Jesus has one message for you. And it says in verse 25 here, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. I want you to know something. Historically, there is no evidence whatsoever. Many of you have been taught this, and I've probably taught it somewhere in the past, that there was ever a smaller doorway for a camel to get on its knees and crawl through the hole. Yeah, we've heard a lot of things. But there's no evidence historically of that. There's no evidence that any walled city had that. Because you know what? If a, ne if, a, if a camel can get on its knees and crawl through, then a man with a sword can run through it. There's no evidence of that. Jesus spoke of a literal needle, which, by the way, Luke the physician used a different word. A.T. Robertson mentions this for the word needle. The word, according to A.T. Robertson, the word for an ordinary leave, needle is rapa. But Luke, in Luke 18.25, employs the word belong, which is a medical term for a surgical needle not used elsewhere in the New Testament. What that means is, you, for, is this. It's impossible for you to get saved any other way than the grace of God. That's what that verse is saying. No more than you could go through the eye of a needle on your own can you get into the kingdom of God on your own. It's impossible. And so, I want you to know something. Jesus made that statement before the age of grace, the church age. He made that statement during the age of the law, dispensation of law. So he's saying there's nothing you can do to earn salvation. Salvation was not earned by works then. Salvation is not acquired before the law or by the law. And by the way, salvation was not earned before the law. The law came with Moses. There was a lot of time between Moses and creation. Listen, if works ever saved anyone... I want you to understand this in closing. If works ever saved anyone, it would have saved Cain. He brought his best. I would have loved to have had a feast from that bounty. I bet it was the best food that we had ever... We don't see that kind of food. Why? We're so far away from the Garden of Eden. I can't imagine what he brought. If his works were not good enough, but rather what was good enough, a blood sacrifice, works has never saved anybody. Never. Only the blood of Jesus Christ. From the Garden of Eden until John the Baptist made this statement, Behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. Everything pointed to the cross. Everything pointed to the cross. Father, we pray this morning that you would take these words. Search our hearts, Lord. Help us to evaluate where we stand. Help us not to be hardened in our views. I don't care who we are. Help us to learn. Help us to grow. Help us to seek truth. And Lord, we'll give you the praise for that in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would, please stand together.